We all know that we send our ESP32s to deep sleep to save energy. But do you know the other possibilities to save energy, like light sleep and clock reduction? And what about modem sleep? Gritty YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent, with a new episode and fresh ideas around sensors and microcontrollers. Remember, if you subscribe, you will always sit in the first row. Let's start with this table of the ESP32 datasheet. It lists several modes and their power consumptions. Active mode, modem sleep, light sleep, deep sleep, hibernation and power off. Most of us know the active as well as the deep sleep mode. Today we will investigate the other modes and try to reduce the chip's clock rate. Also a possibility to save energy. And we will see the effect of these modes on Wi-Fi, serial and I2C communication. In the end, you should have a good overview to make the correct decisions for your projects. With this knowledge, you can save time because not everything works as described. And as a side effect, you will learn some tricks for instrumentation and breadboarding. The test setup is simple. I use a barebone ESP32 VROOM module mounted on this simple PCB. Here is the first trick. Do not search for hours why your I2C connection does not work. I already did it. Pin 21 is not connected to anything. Unfortunately, GPIO 21 is the standard I2C pin for SDA. Here is how you can change GPIO 21 to GPIO 19 and still use the PCB. I power this board with a Power Profiler 2 shown in video number 386. It measures small currents and displays them on a PC screen. The next device is an oscilloscope or a logic analyzer to measure the speed of signals. And the third are sketches for the tests. The first sketch tests the different clock rates. You might ask, why do I want to reduce the clock rate? Generally, field effect transistors like those used in the ESP32 consume more power with higher clock rates. Let's check if this is true and why. Here is an IRFC44N N-channel FET used as a simple switch. The theory says that the gate has a parasitic capacitance that must be charged and discharged when the FET is switched. But before I create this simple setup on a breadboard, I show you a trick learned from a viewer. If you turn the three pins of this transistor by 90 degrees, they can be inserted much easier and your breadboard will live longer. Try it and you will be surprised. To prove the point, I connect a 4 volt square wave to the gate and add this 10K resistor. Suppose the hypothesis is true, the parasitic capacitor must be charged and discharged every time the signal level changes. In that case, we should see a current through the resistor and a voltage across it. Here we also should see that the transistor switches on and off. I connect the yellow cable to this point and the probes ground to ground. And really we see the square wave. But how can we measure the voltage across this resistor? Usually I would connect the probes ground to this side and the probe to the other side. But in this case if I would connect the probes ground here, I would shorten the gate directly to ground because the other probe is connected to ground. So we have to find a better way. Do you know it? We connect one channel to this side and a second channel to that side and measure both signals referenced to ground. Because all oscilloscopes can subtract one signal from the other, we get the voltage across the resistor. This is why a four channel oscilloscope sometimes is a good thing. Anyway, here is the result. A typical charge recharge curve of a capacitor. At low frequencies, this spike is short compared to the overall time and the power lost in the gate resistor is small. However, the relative length increases with increasing frequency and more power is dissipated. QED or quote era demonstrandum 
as our mathematics professor used to say. This effect applies to millions of tiny FET transistors inside the ESP32. So we should see a decrease in power consumption with a decreased clock rate. Unfortunately, we also see a reduction in processing speed. On the other hand, we must confess, most of our ESP32s run nearly idle in simple sensor projects. Next question, how we can change the processor speed? Like most MCUs, the VROM module has a crystal oscillator with a fixed clock frequency of 40 MHz. But the datasheet says its clock rate is 240 MHz. What is true? Actually, both facts are accurate. We can multiply and divide frequencies if we know how. Frequency division is straightforward. As an example, I use a counter which resets after two counts. So if we feed it with a frequency of 100 kHz, its output shows 50 kHz. If we added the second counter, we would get 25 kHz, and so on. Multiplying frequencies is done using phase-locked loops or PLLs. I showed this principle in video number 331, where we needed a very high frequency of nearly 10 GHz. With a 40 MHz oscillator, the ESP can create various clock rates – 240, 160, 80, 40, 20 and 10 MHz. But how can we choose them? Fortunately, this is very simple. If you choose the standard ESP32 DEF module, you get the pull-down menu to choose the clock rate. You also see that only the first three have the marking Wi-Fi. This means that Wi-Fi does not work for lower frequencies. The second possibility is to include this command in our sketch as I did here. It sets a particular clock frequency. While running a test sketch, we measure the current consumption using the power profiler. Here we see the resulting curve. There are three turns. Without issuing the Wi-Fi.mode command, in access point mode and in station mode. After these turns, the ESP32 reboots. The first sequence starts with light sleep and continues with 240, 160, 80, 40, 20 and 10 MHz. The second and the third sequence contain all clock speeds, but no light sleep. Each job toggles one GPIO as fast as possible without using register tricks. Like that we can compare the computing speed. This is the resulting current curve. First the ESP boots and then goes to light sleep, consuming only minimal current. After that, it runs at 240 MHz without Wi-Fi. We will later discuss this mode. Then it continues with all the other clock rates down to 10 MHz. As said before, we toggle a pin 1 million times at every clock rate and we see that it takes longer and longer. At 240 MHz, 1 million toggles take 278 milliseconds. At 10 MHz, it takes 7.8 seconds, 28 times longer. Actually, it should only be 24 times. The next turn starts at 240 MHz in AP mode. We see the typical current spikes of the ESP32 when it transmits on 2.4 GHz. We also see that Wi-Fi stops working below 80 MHz. The spikes disappear. And as expected, the current consumption is reduced with lower clock rates. The next round is in station mode. No spikes are created, but the average power consumption is similar to the AP mode. With the Power Profiler 2, I can easily measure the average current consumption for each clock rate. Here are the resulting curves. The x-axis is the speed and the y-axis is the power consumption. The blue curve is with and the orange one is without Wi-Fi. There is a vast difference. At full speed and Wi-Fi, the power consumption is about 150 mA and without Wi-Fi only 69 mA. Light sleep only consumes 1.5 mA, by the way. 
And now we have to discuss my findings on modem sleep because not all ESP projects need Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. Unfortunately, I did not find a command modem sleep or similar. And there are several discussions about what it really means and how it can be enabled. I included all commands I found in one function. Maybe some commands do the same. The results were disappointing. As soon as I inserted Wi-Fi mode Wi-Fi off, the CPU started to behave strangely. The power consumption did no more decrease with lower clock frequency. And I also saw that deep sleep did no more work. So I do not suggest using this function in conjunction with lower clock frequencies or deep sleep. Or at least you test your sketch thoroughly. Maybe you know more. The only safe way of disabling the modem seems to not enable it right from the start. Like that, we get to the orange curve. As soon as we issue the Wi-Fi mode command in our sketch, we change to the blue curve. These are my two cents, which can extend or reduce battery life by 50%. Usually, we want to connect sensors to our MCU or use the serial monitor to debug our sketches. This is the purpose of the second sketch. I do the same clock step down, read the sensors and print the results to serial. Like that we see if we get sensor readings and if serial print also works at lower clock rates. I use a popular BME 280 pressure sensor for my tests, by the way. Like Wi-Fi, serial works fine down to 80 MHz. Then it starts to produce gibberish. And we cannot see if the sensor still works. Fortunately, we can assume that serial still works, but at a lower baud rate. Let's try half the speed, 57600. Really, serial works at 40 MHz and it looks like the sensor still delivers values. The subsequent expected baud rates are 28800 and 14400. Both are not supported by the Arduino IDE. This is why I use Serial 2 and add a second USB to Serial Adapter and PuTTY. And really we see that everything works down to the lowest clock frequency. Why does the sensor still deliver values at these low clock rates? As we saw, Serial had some issues. We know I2C has two wires, SCL and SDA. SCL creates a clock and SDA transports data in both directions. In our case, the I2C clock rate is around 350 kHz at higher frequencies and 100 kHz at lower clock rates. Perfectly fine for most sensors because they align their data transfer with a clock signal. Looking at the different clocks, we see that the crystal is always 40 MHz. The CPU speed changes according to our settings. But what is ABP? It is the internal clock rate for the peripheral bus. It works at 80 or 20 MHz. The compiler most probably adjusts some ESP internal divider ratios to get this effect. As we already saw in the curves, we have a diminishing return. From 240 to 160 MHz, we save a lot of energy. From 20 to 10, only a little. And we have to adjust the speed of the serial console. Fortunately, sensors should still work OK. Wi-Fi also works OK till 80 MHz. So without a pressing need, I would not go below this 80 MHz. Any other low-hanging fruits? Maybe you compile your battery-operated project with 80 MHz. If it still works, you have extended the battery life by nearly 30% with no additional effort. But what about light sleep? It is very different from deep sleep and behaves more like deep sleep of other processors like the Atmel I used in my mailbox sensor project in video number 402. While the ESP32 boots after each deep sleep, light sleep continues where it fell asleep. It also keeps all variables. So it behaves similarly to a delay command. But the power consumption is very low only around 1.5 mA. Replacing all your delays with light sleep can also be a quick win. 
but only if you do not use Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. I tried the standard PopSup MQTT sketch and failed miserably. Wi-Fi seems to do a lot of stuff in the background and does not like it if we send the processors to sleep from time to time. The last optimization is deep sleep. Compared to all other means we saw before, deep sleep is much better because it only consumes microamperes. But because we expect our systems to run for a long time, saving a few percentage points still is a good thing. This can be done by adding this code before the sleep statement, which disables the ULP as well as the RTC memory. Be aware that this attribute does no more work and your ESP32 loses all its RTC memory during deep sleep. This mode, by the way, is called hibernation. We saw that we have a few ways to optimize the power consumption of our ESP32s. The first and foremost is to use either an optimized board, your own design or a barebone PCB as I used in this video. Standard dev boards have horrible power consumptions. If you do not need Wi-Fi, avoid the Wi-Fi mode command in your sketch. It can save you up to 50%. The next level is reducing the clock rate to 160 or 80 MHz. I would not go below because the savings are no more big and you have no Wi-Fi or BLE and no serial debug with the Arduino IDE. The clock rate can be reduced at compile time or on the spot in the sketch. Light sleep can replace delays if you do not use Wi-Fi or BLE. It can also save a considerable amount of energy. If you switch off everything during deep sleep, you gain a few parts of a microampere. But because deep sleep already consumes low power, it is a few percentage points. All in all, I learned a few things and I'm sure I will use one or the other tricks in future projects. At least if they are battery operated. As always, you find all relevant links in the description. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please consider supporting the channel to secure its future existence. Thank you. Bye.